On Saturday, June 19, 1993, in Clarksdale, Mississippi, commonly known as the birthplace of blues music, 22-year-old Phyllis Rome was preparing for a night out at a local juke joint blues club. It was a popular spot for locals to gather and listen to blues music and have a good time. Phyllis spent what we now know as her last night out on the town. Everyone saw her there, but what happened when she left is unfound. Phyllis was deaf and mute, making her an easy target to whatever evil that lurked into the hot summer night on June 19th. There was an unconfirmed sighting of Phyllis on that same night by a relative. Just a few days later, another unconfirmed sighting of Phyllis was by an official at a government building. But then, that statement was oddly retracted. This case is an interesting one, because there are hardly any details on Phyllis's disappearance, no details on her personal life, no updates, not many mentions of Phyllis on any public platform except for the original details that were reported back in 1993 from the Clarksdale Press Register newspaper 30 years ago, and the details on her family and friends are scarce. But with some consistent and profound digging, I was able to locate a few family members. So what happened to Phyllis Rome on the evening of June 19, 1993? Did she just walk away from her life? Could this be directly related to law enforcement or someone connected? Or could it be something even more sinister, where someone is harboring three decades of mystery and the truth lies somewhere hidden in the depths of the small town of Clarksdale? This is the Missing Found Podcast. I'm your host, Jaden Harlow. Before we get into the case, I have a few details to share about the show. The Missing Found is an investigative true crime podcast focusing mainly on unsolved missing person cases in the Black community. The cases that I cover have either gone cold, have little to no media coverage, or have gone without conclusion. You can follow the show on Instagram at The Missing Found or on Medium at The Missing Found to read our original script. I also would like to mention that we now have a case suggestion form in the show notes or description box that you can complete to submit your case suggestions that are of the Black and Missing. We have a Patreon that's now available for you to become a member in our private community to discuss cases deeper beyond our case analyses through private discussions with me, add free episodes, gain complimentary access to our original script, early releases, and much more that's exclusive for members only. The show is now available on all major podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. For Apple Podcasts, please be sure to give us a five-star rating to help the show reach a broader audience to help find our missing. To access all things of The Missing Found, you can visit our website, themissingfound.com. I ask that you please like, share, subscribe, and comment to share your thoughts on this case. This is Case Episode 18, The Disappearance of Phyllis Rome. Today, and back then, it's not hard to imagine that a young woman goes out, enjoys a night out on the town, assumingly just to never be seen or heard from again for 30 years. We see them as a missing person, but what we don't know is what happened, what the person endured, what they are enduring, where they are, whatever became of them, or if what happened to them ended on the same night. When you think about it, Think about how many last nights people have had. How many nights have we gone out with it possibly being our last night? We're going to offer a fresh look at the case details and examine what little information that has been publicly shared, review a map that retraces Phyllis's last moments, then finally break down every detail, the sightings, the oddities, then close with my opinion. This case is an odd one, and as I've stated, there just aren't many details on Phyllis or anyone that was in her circle. It's a case that is missing some key details. There are some questions that I have, and I'm sure you will too. We may can piece this together. When you have rumors, it can become perplexing. But there also may be some truth that lies within them. So who was Phyllis Rome? Phyllis Rome, nicknamed Nisi, 
was born on Tuesday, March 16, 1971, and resided in Clarksdale, Mississippi. If you know anything about Clarksdale, Mississippi, then you would know Clarksdale is most notably referred to as the birthplace of blues because it was home to several blues musicians, notably Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker, and Ike Turner. The Delta Blues Museum is also located there, and the Sunflower River Blues Festival is held in the city each August. From the melancholic, somber tones of blues, the greats that came from the city and had successful careers, all the way to the heinous acts of racism that's embedded in the history and culture of Mississippi. Only 38 years prior to 1993, a mere 30 miles from Clarksdale in Drew, Mississippi, 14-year-old Emmett Till was kidnapped and brutally murdered by two white men at the call of now-deceased Carolyn Bryant Donham. What happened to Phyllis remains a cold mystery, a case that still haunts the city of Clarksdale, but whatever happened to Phyllis had seemed to have went dark. We don't know much about Phyllis, as I've already stated. Where she worked, where she went to school, her hobbies. Well, it was said that she loved to dance. Her immediate family, if she had any siblings, and not even any information on her mother and father. What we do know is that Phyllis was deaf and mute. When a person is deaf and mute, they cannot hear nor can they speak and would communicate through sign language. The details are slim with Phyllis, but there is one detail that I was able to locate on a relative, but things took a turn as of recently in 2018. I will share this later into the analysis. The case details. On Saturday, June 19th, 1993, Phyllis made plans to go to Red's Blues Club at 398 Sunflower Avenue in Clarksdale, Mississippi. The club was only 0.9 miles from her home at 409 McKinley Street. This is a 20 to 25 minute walk and a three minute drive. Witnesses have reported seeing Phyllis at the club around 8 p.m. that evening. Then the events after that are obscure. Phyllis never made it home. Her mother reported her missing on Monday, June 21st, 48 hours later. After she was reported missing, Phyllis's cousin claimed he or she saw her near Tony's Liquor Store, which is located on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. This sighting was unconfirmed, but that street is where Phyllis would have had to travel in order to get back home. There were several rumors that came about that stated Phyllis was murdered and her body was dumped somewhere in downtown Clarksdale. It was said that law enforcement walked the area, but nothing ever materialized of her remains. Now, days later, Clarksdale police officer said that Phyllis was no longer a missing person because she was cited at the Coahoma County Courthouse by an official, which was about a mile from the vicinity she was in. Clarksdale PD claimed that she was cited, no longer missing, but just not home. Later, they retracted that statement and said Phyllis is still missing. Odd. This is where the case of Phyllis starts and ends, at least on public record. Now, I want to analyze the case further and piece what little information we do know together. So we'll start with the facts. The facts of the case are slim to none, and we can only rely on what has been publicly stated. I'm going to discuss the facts of what we do know and everything that we don't know and analyze those elements further. So what we do know. We know Phyllis was at Red's Blues Club sometime during that evening. Phyllis was positively identified being at Red's on June 19th. At some point, she arrived, and she had to eventually leave the club. What this means is, in short, we know she arrived and we know she left. That's what we know. That's all we know. Now, with everything we don't know, we don't know what time Phyllis left her home to head to Red's, how she ended up at Red's, we don't know if she walked or caught a ride. Who did she attend the club with or did she attend solo? Who were all present at Reds? Was this routine for her on Saturdays to go to Reds or have a night out? If she was deaf, why would she be at a blues club that is exclusively to listen to music? Now I will dive into this shortly. What time did she arrive and what time did she leave? Who is Phyllis Rome? Was she in a relationship? How was her relationship with her parents? 
Did she live with her parents? And lastly, why did Clarksdale PD make such statement without solid proof that it was, in fact, Phyllis at the courthouse? The Breakdown Reds Blues Club and Lounge Reds is located at 398 Sunflower Avenue, right before the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Bridge that is situated above the Big Sunflower River. The club, Reds, is still in business as of today and operates out of the same building that Phyllis was said to be at on the evening of June 19, 1993. Now, it's not clear who attended the club on that evening and if those patrons were ever formally identified and questioned. We know Phyllis was present at the club because she was positively identified there. This could simply mean that patrons who were there on that night saw her inside or around the club. This translates to her arriving there safely. We can almost rule out that something happened on her way there. We can't rule it out completely because something very well could have happened, but she still walked into Red's. This could have been an altercation, stalking situation, targeting, or something. We just know she was present at the club at some point in the night. The club features an intimate setting with very little lighting. Whoever was there may have seen her since the area was so small. It's also not impossible to believe that there were people there interacting with her and knowing her in the community since she lived in the vicinity and deaf and mute. She may have been a regular there, or it could have been her first time. We unfortunately don't have that information. I would like to know how were they able to positively ID her there, and who? How did she arrive to the club? When I initially looked at the case, I felt she walked. There are no details alluding to or stating that she walked, but I wonder how did she get there? If she caught a ride by a family member or someone else, then surely they had to be questioned. It then makes you question if the person who took her just dropped her off or stayed with her at Red's that night. If she went to meet someone, then I wonder who that person was or if her family knew of a person she may have been meeting that night, or if it's out of character, if she even caught a ride in the first place. I have no reason to believe that she walked except for the mere fact that her cousin claimed to have seen her walking near Tony's liquor store. The time of the sighting was never made public, but it was most likely the time after she left the club since this detail was a prominent mention. If the sighting is true, that would mean she ended up leaving Reds and was assumingly walking on her way home, which Tony's is on the route she would have walked to go home. With that lack of detail for this element, it leaves it to a mystery. I mapped out the walk from her home to Reds. It would have been a 21 to 25 minute walk at normal pace and an only three minute drive. The walk is along Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. It is a long stretch of road that does not seem likely that she would have taken a walk at that distance in June Mississippi weather, though not impossible. There are no reports stating that she was picked up by someone. I can only assume this would have been mentioned because it would change the trajectory of the case because we would be adding an additional person in this mystery. What we don't know is if she caught a ride to Reds, halfway, or she walked. After looking at the facts, I believe she walked. Because of this, I don't believe this outing was out of character for her. In fact, she may have visited Reds often since it was a local and a popular blues juke joint. Again, this is all assumption and an educated guess, based on the context and case facts. It seems likely that she may have gone out often, she knew her way around town, may have been well known in her community since she was deaf and mute, and that is something the community would know to alert drivers for her safety. Was Phyllis the type to go out alone, or was she often accompanied by someone? I want to make it clear that because she was deaf and mute, it does not mean she stopped her life or did not have a normal life. At age 22, it is typical for a young woman to hang out on a Saturday night. We just don't know if she was with someone or by herself. Filling the music. I saw a few commentators ask why would she be at a club since Phyllis was deaf and mute? This is interesting because even when someone is deaf, they can feel the music in an amazingly unique way. They can feel the vibrations of music. This goes back to Phyllis and the lack of knowing who she was. 
Going out could have been a routine thing she did on weekends, and she liked the environment of being in a blues club. A family member stated that she enjoyed dancing. This would correlate with her going to a nightclub, blues club, or a juke joint. This is yet another key element that we don't know the full scope of details on in order to connect with our victim. The Odd Sightings and the Retracted Statement Around the time she would have left Red's, a cousin saw her walking near Tony's liquor store on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. When I took a look at the map, I virtually walked and retraced her possible steps after walking out of her front door, which her home seemingly has been demolished and is now a vacant lot. Now, and it's not exactly clear if she walked or if she caught a ride that evening. That's what we're trying to figure out. But there is only one liquor store on that stretch. I assumed that liquor store was Tony's, which was only minutes away from her home, which would mean that she was in close proximity to home after leaving Red's and walking in the direction of her home. This is not a fact because we don't have enough information on the sighting to say that the liquor store that I saw on the route is, in fact, the route Phyllis would have taken or if it was actually Tony's liquor store. I assume she walked from her home to Red's and Red's to home because of the cousin's alleged sighting of her walking that evening. My questions are, why didn't the cousin stop? Who was the cousin? Who did the cousin see her with or was she alone? Was she going into the liquor store or just in the area near it? And was it really Phyllis? The area does not seem well lit, nor does it seem safe enough to walk at night especially a young woman who is deaf and mute at that hour, eliminating her capability to hear and making it rather difficult to communicate with someone who isn't versed in sign language if there was something wrong or she encountered danger along her way. If she was abducted along her walk, it would have been silent unless she put up a fight and was heard that way. There was another odd alleged sighting of Phyllis at the Cahoma Courthouse. An official from the courthouse reported they recalled seeing her after she was reported missing. This official stated that the woman they saw matched the description of Phyllis in the Clarksdale Press Register. Strangely, Clarksdale PD shared that Phyllis was no longer missing due to the unconfirmed sighting. This information, in my opinion, was prematurely shared with the public without fact-checking this possibility. Then, the statement was later retracted. Another officer stated that Phyllis had not returned home and is still a missing person. When I read this element, I thought it was quite strange and negligent on law enforcement's behalf. To me, it felt like they were trying to eliminate her case through any possible mention or update without even fact-checking, almost as if they knew more. And I could be completely wrong. At least I hope I am. The Rumor Mill There was a rumor that Phyllis was murdered and her body was disposed of in downtown Clarksdale. I found this rumor to be unsettling, as anyone would. I wonder who started this rumor and why would anyone want to start this rumor? She was deaf and mute. Who would want to harm her? Unless this person saw this and took advantage of it. Is there any truth to it? I don't know. It's an interesting rumor and started rather quick soon after she went missing. My opinion. This case is a mystery. There's hardly any information on Phyllis nor her case. It's almost like she just vanished without a trace, and that was all. Nothing. No heavy search. No updates. Nothing. This case is cold. But why is it? You mean to tell me that a petite, Attractive 22-year-old black woman who was deaf and mute is not newsworthy enough? And I say that with sarcasm. A case like this should have garnered attention. Really, all missing persons should garner attention, but we have to look at the reality of it. Most cases that are of the black and missing does not get ample coverage. We know that. This case, however, is different because being deaf is classified as a disability in America and the fact that she was mute, she could not communicate verbally. This case should have been handled differently due to her circumstance. I have to point out that if there was something that happened to Phyllis, which I do think something did happen, she would have not been able to scream or yell for help, nor would she have been able to hear what the assumed abductor was saying, which makes this case even more disappointing and heartbreaking. 
The premature reporting on Phyllis being seen in the courthouse raises a cause for concern to me. It's almost as if Clarksdale PD were fishing for information, anything, confirmed or unconfirmed, to get the case off the radar. Whether this was to hide something or they just simply did not care, which we know is not unheard of. This all brings me back to her family. If you were to perform a Google search on Phyllis Rome, you would find no details on her family. Well, I think I now know why. Her immediate relatives are all deceased. At least that is what I read on Facebook from someone who is a relative. I was able to locate one family member who I found to be deceased. His name is Jimmy D. Rome, who died in 2018 at the age of 61, while Phyllis would have been 47 at the time of Jimmy's death. I don't believe this was her father because this would make them only 14 years apart. And I believe her father's name was Wilbur Rome, who was also deceased. This detail has not been confirmed, but it was stated by someone close to the family. Now, I do know about Jimmy's death because I was able to pull that information through Skip Trace. It's not exactly clear what Jimmy's relation was to Phyllis, but it showed his latest address, which was the same address in which Phyllis lived on McKinley Street. I've read a few articles on Phyllis in a podcast episode, but they were unable to locate any family members. It took some profound digging, pulling archives, political affiliations, skip tracing, and a Facebook search to find some details. She has relatives and friends out there, but they either are younger than Phyllis or they knew of her and did not know her. Because her immediate family are all deceased, according to that family member, Perhaps their efforts, and if they knew anything, it died with them. It's unfortunate because I don't have the facts of the case. Unlike my usual cases, an opposing story of what may have happened, and really no updates for 30 years. We also don't know what Phyllis had going on in her personal life. Their residence at 409 McKinley Street is no longer. It appears to now be a vacant lot. I have no idea what happened to the home when and why, but the home is no longer there. It seemed to have been demolished sometime after 2013. As for the courthouse sighting, I don't believe she was ever at the courthouse. Maybe this was an innocent assumed sighting with no ulterior motive, or it could simply be untrue. Then you look at the police force and you would think that they would know better than to take an alleged sighting with no factual hard evidence and communicate it to the media. You also have to consider the rumor. Phyllis murdered and disposed of. I still question, how did this rumor come about and why? When you look at the facts, you would wonder who would want to hurt Phyllis. She was for sure an easy target because of her being deaf and mute. I don't believe this was someone close to her. I believe it was random, and someone may have seen and targeted Phyllis. Again, I don't have the facts to allude to that, but with what has been presented, it seems as if it was random. What I don't know is who did it, how, and where it took place. With a case so cold, and with little to no details, a case like this is not easy to analyze. Phyllis lived in a small town, and everyone most likely knew everyone. Reds was a popular juke joint then, and still a popular juke joint today that is still in operation. Whatever happened on that warm summer night of June 19th, I believe it is a best kept secret. I know someone out there knows what happened. Whoever did this, I wonder if they were close to law enforcement or in law enforcement. It's not something you can ignore. You do have to consider that fact. We know how it is. We're analyzing a case from 1993. Phyllis's family and the community may have conducted their own search, which is why they waited 48 hours to report her missing. It is unclear why they took so long to report her missing. That too raises concern for me. If they did conduct their own search, to what extent? We don't know. We don't know if someone was involved who attended Reds on that night. Someone saw her walking, if she was on a date, if this was racially charged, a gang initiation a passerby, or someone close to Phyllis. Keep in mind that this took place in Mississippi, a place that had and has its share of experiences with Black people. 
My statement is not to direct the attention and possibility that this could have been orchestrated by someone who is of Phyllis's race. I wonder how many times Phyllis took that walk to Red's on June 19th or any other Saturday night on the town. Was someone in the background watching? Or was this a random abduction? Or something far more sinister? Phyllis did not start another life. She didn't just up and leave because she seemed to have had every intention to return home that evening. Until people start talking, we don't have anything without the facts. No updates and not much coverage then and definitely not any now. This case will remain unsolved and sadly cold. Hopefully, this episode would change that. I just don't want anyone to forget her. At the time of Phyllis's disappearance, she was 22 years old, stood at 5 feet, and weighed 100 pounds. Phyllis is a female, African American, has brown eyes and black hair. She is deaf and mute. Phyllis has a medium brown complexion. She also has a tattoo on her upper left arm of the name Mark, and a tattoo on her middle finger with the initial D. Phyllis has a nose piercing and her ears are pierced. She has two piercings on one ear and three piercings on the other. Phyllis was last seen wearing light blue shorts with polka dots, a white shirt, blue socks, and white sneakers. Her nickname is Nisi. Phyllis would be 52 today in 2023. If you have any information or leads in the disappearance of Phyllis Rome, her current whereabouts, or any information concerning Phyllis, it should be directed to the Clarksdale Police Department at 662-621-8151. I want to thank you for your viewership of Phyllis's case. Her family is still awaiting answers. We know people don't just vanish. Someone has the answers to this 30-year, three-decade-long mystery. Whether she left on her own or was taken, Either way, someone at some point had a hand in this. Hopefully, we don't have to go another decade without knowing. As always, please be safe, be vigilant, and always be aware of your surroundings. May God bless and keep you all. I always close with a scripture or words of encouragement because in all of these cases, only God himself can solve them. Through him, all things are possible. I have told you these things, so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. John 16.33